If you're watching this video, then I'm pretty sure you already understand how important a good VPN can be for maintaining the security and privacy of your mobile communications. Whether you need to use your phone for banking over a public airport or coffee shop Wi-Fi connection, or you're worried about the wrong people listening in on your online interactions, the tunneled encryption a good VPN gives you can be invaluable. The trick, however, is finding a VPN that really is good and that's both convenient and affordable. There are plenty of commercial VPN services out there, and configuring one of those for your phone or laptop is usually simple enough. But such services can come with two potential downsides. They're often expensive, with payments averaging around $10 monthly, and you can never be quite 100% sure that they aren't accidentally or on purpose leaking or misusing your data. Also, Cheaper VPNs often limit your data use and the number of devices you can connect. However, if you happen to have a cloud-based Linux server running anyway, building a WireGuard VPN can be a simple and free way to add some serious, compromise-free security and privacy to your life. If you plan to limit the VPN to just devices owned by you and a few friends, you'll probably never even notice any extra resource load on your server. Even if you had to fire up and pay for a dedicated AWS EC2 T2 Micro Reserved instance, for example, the annual cost should still come out significantly cheaper than most commercial VPNs. And as a bonus, you'll get complete control over your data. Right now, I'm going to show you how all that would work using the open source WireGuard software on an Ubuntu Linux server. Why WireGuard? Because it's really easy to use is designed to be particularly attack resistant, and it's so good at what it does that it was recently incorporated into the Linux kernel itself. The actual work to make this happen really will take only five minutes or less. First off, you need to open the UDP port 51820 in whatever firewall you're using. Here's how that would look for the security group associated with an AWS EC2 instance. All the commands and configuration settings I'm going to show you here will be available for cutting and pasting on my own website at bootstrapit.com slash wireguard VPN. Now, on the Linux server, I'll open a sudo admin shell so I'll have the permissions I'll need for what's coming. We'll begin by installing the WireGuard and ResolveConf packages. Technically, we probably won't need ResolveConf here. But since that's what you'd need if you wanted to set up a Linux machine as a WireGuard client, I thought I'd throw that in here too. The wg gen key command generates a new private encryption key and saves it as a file in the etsy WireGuard directory that was automatically created when we installed WireGuard. Don't worry, by the time you see this video, I'll already have deleted this particular key. There's no way I'd expose any of my active keys this way. The change mode command sets the appropriate restrictive permissions for that private key file. Like everything in Linux, there are other ways to get this done, but just make sure you do it. Next, we'll use the value of our private key to generate a matching public key, which will also be saved to the etsy WireGuard directory. I'll move into the WireGuard directory and confirm that those two key files do, in fact, exist. The goal is to add the server's public key to the WireGuard configuration on all the client devices you'll be using, and then to add those clients' public keys to the server configuration here. Private keys should never leave the machines from which they're created, and should always be carefully protected. We're now ready to create a server configuration file. Following convention, I'll name the file wg0.conf, but you can give it any name you'd like. You can also have multiple configurations existing at the same time. Here's what our configuration will look like. Notice that this file has three sections, an interface and two peers. The interface section defines the private NAT network address that our server will use. That's the private address the clients will connect to after first requesting access through the server's public IP address, of course. You don't have to follow my addressing as long as you use a valid private IP range that 
doesn't overlap with any network blocks being used by either your server or client. Matching the UDP security group rule I set up earlier in AWS, and defining the listen port as 51A20. Finally, I've pasted the server's private key here, so WireGuard will be able to authenticate incoming client requests. The first peer section contains nothing more than the public key and a signed private IP address of one client. The second peer section does the same for a second client. Getting those public keys from the client is the most manual task involved in this whole setup. But since this is your own VPN, you can usually find a way to copy and paste directly into your server configuration so you don't have to painfully type the whole thing in. That should be everything. I'll use the wg-quick command to bring the VPN to life. Up tells WireGuard to read the wg0.conf configuration we just made and use it to build a new VPN interface. Running wg will show us that it worked. Finally, I'll run this systemctl enable command to tell Linux to load this WireGuard interface automatically each time the server reboots. That's all we'll need from the server end of things. Getting your client device set up with WireGuard is either going to be much easier or more or less the same. What does that mean? Well, if you're working with Windows, Mac OS, Android, or iOS, then there are links to GUI apps available from this WireGuard.com slash install page. Those apps will generate key pairs for you. You'll only need to enter the server's IP address or domain and its public key. You'll then take the client's public key and add it to the server wg0.com file the way I showed you earlier. However, if it's a Linux PC or laptop client that you want to add, then it's a little bit more complicated. You'll basically follow all the steps you saw for the server configuration, including the key generation. You'll even create a configuration file named wg0.conf, if that's the name you like. But here's how that config file should look. The interface section represents the client machine this time, while the peer section down below refers to the server. Let's begin with interface. The private IP address should match the address you gave this particular client in the configuration on the server. If you need your client to bypass a local DNS server, you can specify a custom DNS server here. This one is the one provided by Google. Instead of hard coding your local private key into your configuration file the way we did on the server, you could tell WireGuard to read the private key file whenever it loads. This is probably a bit of a security best practice, and we could just as easily have done it on the server too. Finally, we test our connection with this ping command. The peer or server configuration requires the server's public key, which is added here. The endpoint is where you tell WireGuard to find the server. Nothing will work without this one. That would require the server's public IP or its domain name, followed by the port you've chosen. Again, 51A20 is the WireGuard default. Finally, the allowed IP setting defines the network address range you'll be using and the optional persistent keep alive value can prevent drop connections. You launch WireGuard on the client exactly the same way you did on the server using wg-quick up wg0. Again though, all those steps will only be necessary for Linux clients. You can use the apps for other platforms. So that's that. Just as I said, a working VPN in around five minutes work. For more technology goodness, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. And when you've got a moment, check out the many Linux, security, data analytics, and AWS books and courses available through my bootstrap-it.com website.